Hello and welcome. Welcome back. Today we do the Incas. I N C A S. The Incas are later than the Mayans. They go from about 1400 to 1533. They're going to be in South America and they are the largest territorial empire of the peoples we're discussing. Because they're the largest territorial empire, there's a huge diversity. They're going to stretch from Colombia all the way down to, to Chile. Um, there's going to be some 10 million people in this. This is, that is a very large group of people. Um, that's the size of, say, Egypt in the ancient world. And Egypt was always considered one of the richest, most populous places around. So we're talking about a large um, empire. That's successful. It has some 30 languages in it. So it's very diverse. And it's in a weird place. Now, most empires we've talked about, large empires we talked about, are in flatlands. Whereas the Incas are going to be between the sea and the Andes. They are built into the mountains. And if you've ever gone to Chile or more importantly, seen movies or the such that talk about South America, the sea to into the Andes, the Andes are big mountains, um, goes up fast. You hit 2,000 feet really fast from the sea. And so what we have is a hard land to farm. You have to really cut into the mountain. This is not Kansas. This is not Mesopotamia. And this is certainly not Egypt. You are cutting into the mountain doing tiered farms. If you're on the video, you can see a picture of this. Um, but the Incas are really successful because of the potato. P-O-T-A-T-O. -T -T no E. The potato. Because the potato is huge in calories. It will grow in almost any land and is high in caloric content. So not only will the potato be the, the foundation of the Incan Empire, it will be the foundation of the Spanish empires in the New World. And then it will become the food, if you're Irish, you know this, the food for poor people in Europe who don't have a lot of land but can get a food out that is high in calories. And so that allows the Incas to be, to feed their large population. Now they have other things that they're going to grow, of course, but the potato is going to be the, the starch, the main caloric piece. They, unlike the Mayans, have a centralized government. This is an empire rather than a bunch of, of independent cities that are kind of connected to each other, this is a centralized government with local governors. The Incas have strong kings. And why do they want strong kings? Why do they have strong kings? Because it's the only way to keep people connected. Remember, we're in a hard land between the sea and the top of the Andes. People need help. Independence doesn't work here very easily because if it snows, if you snow 10 feet or you get an avalanche and you need someone to help you, who's going to help you? You need somebody who can tell the next town over, look, you got to go help them. Send people, I'll send some money, go dig them out. Because otherwise, people are going to say, oh, well, dude, we got, we got snow here. We're not, I'm not going. It's cold. I'm not going to go. You need to have a government that can connect these people, help these people in bad times. You also need a government that can build the infrastructure to bind them together. The roads, the bridges, the tunnels. No local town is rich enough or has enough people to do it on their own. 
So you need a centralized government, i.e. and strong kings of that government in order to both get the money in the form of taxation to build the infrastructure that will bind the people together and help them in times when times get bad. This is very similar to kings building walls in Mesopotamia. If you don't have a strong king, you don't get the walls. If you don't get the walls, the nomads come along and kill you sooner or later. Well, we're not so worried about nomads in South America for the Incas. We're more worried about natural disasters, famine, flooding, mudslides, avalanches in the winter. And this kind of ability to protect people when bad things happen. They don't have alphabetic writing. They have a writing system that's called the Kipu, Q-U-I-P-U. It's uh, strings with knots in them. And all of those knots symbolize some piece of information. What information does it symbolize? We have no idea. Absolutely none. There's two reasons why. One. When the Spanish saw this, they didn't care and burned plenty of them or just discarded them. The second is that so few remain that we really have no idea what they say. There's not enough input to get an output out of. We know what they were used for. We don't know what they would say. So, advantage. What is the advantage of the kipu? The advantage is... And you can take a look in the video. It's up in our upper right corner. If you if you don't, it's a, say, a necklace. You could tie it around your neck, but really you wouldn't. But you could tie it around your neck. It looks like a necklace with lots of 50, 75 strings coming out of the neck piece. And on those strings are, are knots in different areas. The strings are also different colors. I don't know if that's from time or they are different fabrics and thus mean something. Um, I don't know the, what's, what the picture is symbolizing. But the advantage is you can store a lot of information in one of these. Like an email chain, you could have the entire conversation in these series of knots. You can know what it says, who said what, what the response was, what the response to the response was, what the response to the response to the response is. The advantage is you could store a massive amount of information on one of these. Much better than a book. Or more efficiently than a book. So there's that advantage. And that's a huge advantage. It's an archive. It has lots of information. Another advantage, it's light. It's easy to roll up. It's easy to hold, put away. It's easy, easy to pack up or carry. It's light. Now remember, there's no horses. There's no oxen. You want to go from Colombia to Chile to bring uh, news? Some, what, what is it, 3,000 miles, give or take? Maybe more. You got to run it. And there'll be a series of male runners developed in order to bring news. But if you got books, big, heavy books, leather books, sheepskin paper books, you can't do that. It's too heavy. It's exactly why people have traded in their, their hardcover books when they travel on an airplane for their, for their Kindles or their iPads because you could store a whole lot more information on the Kindle or the iPad than you can in the one book. So that's what we're talking about. The advantage is, it is information is light, it is transferable, it is easy to get from place to place, and it is archived. It is everything. It is all the information that you need.
It is the history of the information, which is good to get. So what are our disadvantages? Well, it should strike you very easily. Who can read it? I can't read it. You can't read it. No one in the modern world can read it. The knowledge is, in a way, like Morse code was. It's, it's in a secret language that if you are educated, you can read it. But how many people are educated in this specific language? It's not written in a language that people spoke. It's written in its own code. So the disadvantage is, is it's not open to everybody. It's only open to the rich and the educated. And rich and educated in this class always go, at least until part three of this class, till the later 20th century, always go together. So the information is not open to everybody. The information is not available to everybody. This entire writing system is not available. Most people can't do it. Most people can't read it, and that means their information is lost, can only be passed down by word, orally. So the big disadvantage is, for a system of knowledge, it's not open to everyone. It's only open to a few. So what happens to the Incas? They all get conquered by Pizarro and his men, some, what, 135 men or so, but mostly by disease. Disease coming down, down the trade routes from, from Mexico, from uh, the Caribbean. And so that by the time Pizarro shows up, um, people are already dying from smallpox and the cold and diseases that their bodies just for 30,000, 20,000 years just hadn't experienced and had no immunity to. Um, Pizarro would, will find a Inca civil war, remember the strong kings, um, and he'll basically, what the Spanish will do, what Pizarro will do, will basically be kill the, kill the kings, cut, cut the head off the serpent, and then put themselves on. Um, a better analogy would be they, they, they remove the top of the pyramid and put themselves on the top. So that a lot of the infrastructure stayed the same and that the Spanish became the strong kings. Now that works to a point. It fails because 95% of the Native Americans will die from various diseases. And so if you're, all of your subjects are dead, you're not really much of a king. And... So the, what the Spanish will end up doing is importing labor. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But so we have a large, successful, organized institution, empire. It is an empire of millions of people, very diverse, all working together, getting along. Uh, we have very impressive infrastructure binding these people together, roads, bridges, tunnels in a hard land. And it's quite successful right up until the Spanish show up and obliterate it, which is what they do in the 1530s. All right. In our next episode, we will talk about the Aztecs, who are perhaps the most famous of the three peoples that we're going to talk about. And um, or at least they're the most they capture the imagination the most. So we'll talk about them next. Bye. Thank you.